be here today for this SAG Foundation conversation with Matt Damon. Um, when people say there are no old-fashioned movie stars left anymore, I simply say Matt Damon. Uh, he has starred in films like Goodwill Hunting, The Talented Mr. Ripley, The Good Born Identity films, and he's... <laughs> Oops. Oh, oh, please, they're doing just fine. Um, He's not only one of the best actors working today, he is also an Oscar-winning screenwriter, and his new film as writer, star, Promised Land, opens this month. Please welcome Matt Damon. <laughs> oh, man, right off the bat. For those of you who didn't hear, there was a gentleman in the second row who screamed, Go Yankees, when I was there. <laughs> I, I get it everywhere I go. <laughs> it's okay. We'll take care of him in the parking lot afterwards. Um, thank you so much for being here today. I know you're incredibly busy, and, and, and you could be doing other things with your time, like heckling Argo. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> since this is a SAG audience, I always like to start by asking, how did you get your SAG card? Uh, I got my SAG card in 1986, um, which I think means I qualify for my pension now. <laughs> uh, I know ben, ben was eight when he got his. I was 16 when I got mine, so he, was, he's, he had a, quite a jump on me. Um, but uh, yeah, I remember really well. Uh, it was a, the, I paid for it with money from a TJ Maxx commercial uh, that Ben and I did together. It was a back to school ad. Uh, we got cut out, <laughs> but they still paid us. Um, and I remember that was the summer that they, the, uh, the, initi the initiation fee was, was always $600, and, I, and all, my, my big focus was how, how I was going to get $600, and, and the TJ Maxx commercial did it, and then they raised it to $800. And so I went to the SAG office in Boston, and then I had to turn around, and I went to my father, and see, neither my mother nor my dad wanted me to uh, do this professionally at that point. You know, they, they wanted me to do th as much theater as I wanted and go to school and, and go to college. And... Uh, and I see their, their point, you know, I, I mean, if it were my kids, I'd, I'd be encouraging the same thing. But they never got in the way of me pursuing a professional career, um, but I just had to do it on my own. And, uh, and so I'd, be, I'd go to New York with Ben on the train or fl on the, you know, uh, back then it was Eastern Airlines. They had the Pan Am shuttle and Eastern Airlines, which then became Trump Air, for any of you back on the East Coast who remember those days. Um, and, uh, but we paid for it out of our own uh, pockets. And, um, and this was a case where I only had $600 and I went to my dad and my dad gave me the, the $200, uh, which was a big gesture because it wasn't just the, the, mo the money, it was that he was saying, okay, I, yeah, I see what this means to you. And um, you know, Ben and I were both very, very determined young people and, and didn't feel as young as we actually were. Um, looking back now at a 14 and a 16 year old, you know, going by themselves to New York um, to audition for the Mickey Mouse Club, uh, uh, it seems kind of crazy, but that was it, 1986. You really auditioned for the Mickey Mouse Club? Unbeknownst to me, yes. It's a, that's kind of a crazy story. I, I was told by the agent that we had at the time that we were meeting the head of Touchstone Pictures. And, uh, and I was a freshman at Harvard, I was 17 years old, and was so excited that I was going to meet this big shot in the movie business that I couldn't contain myself and was walking around the dorm going, yeah, you know, I'm not going to be here for that <laughs> class on Monday because I'm going to be in New York and meeting the head of Touchstone Pictures. <laughs> you know. And when I told everyone in the freshman dorm that I lived in, uh, I set off for New York with Ben and... Uh, we realized something was wrong like, no, probably 30 seconds into the audition when they asked if we could dance. <laughs> I said, that is an interesting question from the head of Touchstone Pictures. Wow, you guys, what is going on? And, uh, and then they dropped the bomb on us that we were actually in an audition for the Mickey Mouse Club. Wow. So, and then I had to go back to college and have everyone go, so what's the head of Touchstone Pictures like? <laughs> you know, he's cool. He's you know, <laughs> Um, I'm curious because you did know from a young age you wanted to be an actor. Did, did you know you wanted this to be your career? Yes. Um, yes, as much as you can know what you want to do for the rest of your life when you're 13. I mean, I, but that was how old I was when I, um, when I really committed to it. And um, 
got in the union when I was 16, and I mean, my college essay, you know, to get into school was about wanting to be an actor, and um, we had a great uh, drama department in our high school, and a really special teacher, and a very rigorous, um, you know, we did shows, that the, the public school that I went to had a, had a state-of-the-art theater that sat 750 people. So, you know, 10 years ago, I did a play in the West End in London, and, and uh, you know, the house was about the same size as the one that I learned, you know, did my first plays in. So, um, you know, which, just, you know, gives you an idea of how, how seriously they took it there. Do you remember some of those early plays and the roles you did? Sure. Uh, <laughs> the, first, uh, the first play that I did in high school uh, was uh, Chushin Gura, the 47 Samurai. It was a kabuki what? play. I in played high I played Waka Sanosuke. That was my name. <laughs> I don't I don't remember. I had a I had a little monologue in the first act. It was a good role. It was a good sized role for a freshman. The play I think was you know four hours long and it, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, you know the, the the theater was not packed to the gills. It was just anybody who had kids in the play was there to watch them slog through a, a, a kabuki play. You know in our in our white face and everything. But um, you know but we didn't know that. I mean we. Uh, you know, um, so, so there was that uh, freshman year, um, you know, there was, a, there was a summer musical every summer, you know, we did Guys and Dolls, um, uh, I, I was just a gambler in that, I was like, yeah, but then when my voice changed, I got the part of Pippin, that was a couple years later. You did Pippin? I did Pippin, yes. Was it, a Pippin is always done with like some stylized thing put on it, was it like Pippin on a spaceship? No, in, in fact, this was just... Pippin, yeah, they really, they just really did it. Um, and uh, although the Ben Vereen role was split up between three actresses. See, actually, there's always that, something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's more, you know, it was, a big, it was a big cast, so they were just trying to let everybody participate, I think. Um, I, the Visit. Uh, Love that. Yeah. Ben, this is ben dark played stuff. my son. Ben played my son in The Visit. <laughs> mm, yeah, uh, he was a freshman and I was a junior. Yeah. <laughs> So. You can still lord that over him today. Yeah, I mean, so. he can lord my performance in The Visit over me. So. <laughs> <laughs> that play was long. I That's mean, a really, I thought you were going to say, we did Neil Simon and you can't take it with you. And no, we didn't. We did less traditional stuff. And then, every, and then every year, in fact, every year, the drama teacher, we had a guy named Jerry Specka, who was hugely influential in, in both of our lives, um, would write a play with uh, the kids and we'd go to the Massachusetts High School Drama Festival with something that we'd written every year. And, uh, and the way that he taught us to write was the exact same stuff that Ben and I did, all those kind of techniques. The process was exactly the same, kind of based in improvisation. And that's, what, that's, how, we, that's how we wrote Good Will Hunting and how we've written subsequently. Do you think that started your love of writing? Or were you doing uh, it before then? No, I mean, I, that, that had a huge, that played a big part in it. Uh, it was really fun and, uh, and really exciting and exhilarating. So I'm, I'm sure that that's where, uh, where it started. But I mean, we really wrote Goodwill Hunting out of necessity. I mean, we just needed a job. And, we, and, and, you know, as you all know, they don't really give those out here. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so it was just, you know, two guys who were eager and young and, and had a lot of energy and a lot of creative energy. And that's a big problem. It was always a big problem with uh, L.A. and New York was, you'd, you know, you'd meet these other actors and, they'd, and it's like you're raring to go and there's nowhere to put that energy. And so, you know, it can get put in horrible places. It can get put in, you know, drugs and all that, uh, you know, or you can try to somehow channel it into something that feels productive. And even if it doesn't, nothing comes of it, it's still productive in the sense that you're working, even if you're getting together in groups and doing scenes or taking classes or trying to cobble together a screenplay, the, the energy's going somewhere. Now, you didn't graduate from Harvard uh, no. because you booked an acting job, is that correct? Yeah, I, I, I would leave there periodically. I got a few jobs while I was there, which was great because I... I was going to school, and so I kind of had cover, you know, and, uh, and so I had a few years where it was like I was auditioning for free, um, you know, because I wasn't going to be, you know, out on my ass if I didn't get the part. And, uh, and so I got a couple things, um, and I would take a leave of absence and lose a semester and then come back. And, and the last time I did it was 1992 was I was supposed to graduate, but I hadn't, and I was in what would have been my senior year in 1993. And I got a part in Geronimo, an American Legend, 
Like they uh, use the full title. That is yeah. the full title. <laughs> And, uh, uh, but it had an, uh, the cast, it had Gene Hackman, it had Robert Duvall, and the star of the movie was Jason Patrick. It was a really great group of actors, mm -hmm. and, um, and everybody was saying it was, you know, th this was it. And so I left Harvard for good because I was sure that, uh, you know, I was, I was, I'm done with that. Like that chapter in my life, um, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm on my way now. And so then that movie uh, opened and made, I think, $4 million in its opening weekend. Um, and it cost like 50. Um, and, uh, but I was out here already, and, uh, and Ben and I were already working on the script. And so we just stayed. So you left school because you thought Geronimo would be a big hit? I was sure. <laughs> I didn't think. I mean, there was no doubt. So, yeah. so you said, bye, Harvard. And yeah, but you know, I had it. I, if things ever got bad, I had it in my back pocket. I could go back, and and uh, I got a lot out of my experience there. Um, you know, and I, I probably went to school for more than four years. I would just be at the end of a semester, and like with Geronimo, I was at the end of a semester, and I, I had to leave to do the movie. Um, and the only way they would let me get credit is if I took my finals at the exact moment that they were being offered back in Cambridge and you know when you're number five on the call sheet you're not shutting a movie down for three hours four different times yeah. you know I mean they'll just hire somebody else so yeah. so I just had to eat the semester yeah you can't say to Robert Duvall I have to go take my final listen I have to <laughs> although he did say when he found out where I went to college when you I heard you go to Harvard and I said yeah and he goes what the hell are you doing here <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking to myself, like, there's not one person at Harvard who would think, who wouldn't think that this is cooler being here with you than like being back there. So that was a good Robert Duvall, by the way. <laughs> yeah, you know, I got you know who does Billy Bob Thornton always did a good Bob, uh, Bobby Duvall. Yeah. We we love we know I, I worked with him uh, 12 or 13 years ago, and uh, and we would just tell stories of Duvall because we loved him so much and appreciate him so much and. Uh, and then Bobby showed up to the set of uh, All the Pretty Horses. And he showed up on a day where we were doing this really intense scene where uh, I, can't, I come out of prison and Henry Thomas is waiting there for me. And it's a really kind of big moment in the book and in the movie. And, 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 and there was Robert Duvall. And, and, uh, and I met with him, chatted a little bit, and then and went to work. And he stayed for a few hours. And then at the end, I, I saw him. And he was walking off down this r road. And he was headed to the, where the cars were parked. And, I went to Billy and I said, Bobby left? And he goes, yeah. And I go, oh. And he goes, no, he said, he said to tell you something. And I said, what? And he said, At, tell him, I said, is he really going to do it like that? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's a critic. Uh -huh. <laughs> when you moved out here and, and Geronimo didn't take off into the stratosphere. Uh, did you ever have to take survival jobs, or did you always make a living as an actor? Uh, well, I made enough. I was close a few times. Like, like Geronimo, uh, that had lasted. And then Ben got uh, a show called Against the Grain, which um, lasted for seven, six or seven episodes. And so between us, we had our rent covered uh, for that year. And then then I moved in with another high school buddy of mine because Ben got engaged. Um, he was like 20, 21, I think, and uh, and so and that ended up not lasting, you know, two months in, into him them living together. So then he showed up <laughs> at our place, and that was when. And then we were really running out of money, and he was on you know our couch, and he's a big dude. I mean, he didn't fit. It was one of those smaller couches. <laughs> legs were on the side, and all his shit was in our living room, and it was like. It was one of those small West Hollywood bungalows where you have like, it's like the main room and then the little kitchen and then bedroom and, and then another bedroom. And so our other buddy was in the back bedroom. I was in this bedroom and Ben was in the only other room in the house where we could really congregate with all of his stuff. So we got really serious about writing. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and that was the place there where we sold the script. Now, as an actor, I think a lot of people uh, first really took notice of you in 1996, Courage Under Fire. Um, such a spectacular movie, opposite Meg Ryan and Denzel Washington. Um, how did that come about? And from what I understand, you had to lose something like 40 pounds in three months? Yeah, yeah, I, I lost a lot of weight. Um, but I really, I mean, you guys know what it's like. I looked at the odds, you know, like how am I even going to break into this business, right? 
all the good parts, you know, if you, if you, as an unknown actor, to get a great role, you know, every, every other actor has to pass on it, right? Every other actor has to pass on it. And then it gets opened up to you and thousands of other people like you, <laughs> right? And you all go. And, uh, you know, there are a few parts, like I was looking at the, you know, a big part when I was, when I was uh, young, younger was uh, Primal Fear. Mm -hmm. Remember that movie with Richard Gere? Oh, yes. And yeah. Edward Norton got the part. Um, After that, everyone passed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so that part became open. Every young actor knew it. I mean, we when I, I paid with money I did not have to take uh, dialect uh, lessons, you know, hired a dialect coach because the kid was, you know, his alter ego was from Kentucky and he was from somewhere else and I didn't, I'd never been to Kentucky. And so, you know, every, we knew that that was it. You know, that was going to launch somebody. Um, there just weren't opportunities, you know, and, uh, and so Courage Under Fire was one of those roles that was small. It was really only, it was two scenes, right? I had two scenes with Denzel, and then the rest of it was, I'm the medic and I'm, you know, you know, Tim Guinea, an actor who I love, who's in Promised Land, actually, uh, is like bleeding out on my lap for, so for six weeks we're in El Paso, and he's like moaning, and I'm just sitting there, and I'm like, I don't think the camera's on us, man. <laughs> Um, but, you know, so it was a, it was a, it was a really thankless job uh, for both of us, <laughs> except for those two scenes yeah. that I had with Denzel. So I had two days of work on that movie, and so I went, well, what do I do? You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's told in flashback, so let me see. How can I change myself? What can I do? The guy's supposed to become a heroin addict. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, so what do I do to make that seem like it happened and, and the only thing I could come up with was uh, to lose as much weight as I could and then put it back on as fast as I could to go do the flashback stuff and so that's what I did. I heard that wasn't good for your health like your doctor was surprised. No it was terrible it, it you know it was bad it was bad because I didn't you know I asked uh, I asked them for a nutritionist which was probably fifteen hundred dollars or twenty five hundred dollars um, and and they said no and you know they I, I don't think they in their defense, I don't think they really knew what I was going to do, um, you know, and they'd probably have requests like this all the time, and they think they're vanity requests, but it was a serious request, and, um, and they turned it down, and so um, I went to, a, we had a friend, we knew a guy, <laughs> who was also a, uh, he, was, he, was, he was Austrian, I mean, funnily enough, he, he, he was Austrian, and he was, an, he was trying to be an actor, but he literally, because he was Austrian, he had Arnold's accent and he was a former bodybuilder so he was really aiming at a small bullseye you know because <laughs> his spot was really taken by yeah. somebody um, but he he put me on his program that he would do for bodybuilding shows but they would do that program three weeks out you know they would do this really kind of reckless thing when they're when they're just you know and and so those guys walk on stage, and, and like you could push it. They look strong, but you could, you could knock them over. They're really suffering at that point um, to kind of leach every bit of everything out so that the veins and the muscles pop out. So, so I did it for like three and a half or four months, mm -hmm. which was just too much, you know, too much. And it, and it, uh, and, but at the same time, you know, it worked. It worked, and, you know, when I, when I got the Rainmaker a year or so later, Coppola said that he'd seen Courage Under Fire really? and, and that that made a big difference. And funnily enough, it was Edward Norton and, and I who were going against each other again for that. And, and, and the Courage Under Fire pushed me over the edge. And when I met, I, I met Spielberg later, and he looked at me and he said, what, you know, and I'd, I'd put myself on tape for Saving Private Ryan. I never heard anything. I don't think the tape ever got to him. The casting director maybe looked at it and chucked it, you know. And... Uh, so I thought he'd, you know, seen it, and he said, well, you know, what do I know you from? And I said, I, I put myself on tape for your movie. He goes, no, I didn't see any tape. He goes, what movies have you been in? I said, I was in a movie called Courage Under Fire. He goes, he goes you know, I turned to my wife when I saw that movie and said, that's the exact guy I want for Private Ryan. I just wish he wasn't so skinny. <laughs> um, so... I feel like I read a uh, interview at the time that said like you couldn't even kiss your girlfriend because you could taste potato chips on her lips. The oil from them, yeah. No, I mean it. Got, it went. I, I, people who have those 
you know, disorders. I, I got it. I totally understood it. Like, if you want to be, because there, I just told myself, I can't allow anything. There's no, no compromising. None. Like, because the second you, you open that door, you know, it's a slippery slope. And I just, I wanted to look back on it and go, I did absolutely everything I could. And now I, I don't look at it that way. And I mean, and I, I'd read this quote that Anthony Hopkins had, you know, maybe 10 years ago, where he said, talked about his process and how it was more economical now. It was more, he got the same amount of work done. He accomplished the same things, but he didn't, he didn't suffer as much. He didn't spin his wheels so much. Um, and uh, that his process had just, you know, was, was efficient. And, um, and that's, that's true. That does, I've, I've found now, I, I, I wanted to relate to it back then, and I do relate to it now, um, because uh, because I think back on some of the things that I did, and they were, you know, maybe not that because that was necessary, but some of the other things I've done, you know, were just kind of didn't really help the performance. They just yeah. kind of wasted my time and energy. <laughs> <laughs> so. Do you have examples you'd be willing to share? Or? Um, yeah, stupid things. Like, I mean, I slept with a football for a movie where I was a football player. Like, you know, I, I mean, I don't know what I was thinking, you know? <laughs> I remember my roommate in college, what are you doing? I was like, no, I'm going to hold it. You see, because if I hold it, you know, and then and I don't know what the hell I was thinking. <laughs> was that school ties? Yeah. Because uh, I believed it. Yeah, no, I mean, but what does that have to do with anti-Semitism in the 50s, you know? I mean, I was, like, totally in the wrong place. But I, I did always want to have some kind of physical connection to what I was doing. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I think I, 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 I wasted, definitely wasted some time. <laughs> uh, did you find Courage Under Fire? I mean, you mentioned two great examples, but did it start opening doors for you, or you were already kind of on your way with writing Goodwill Hunting? Well, we'd sold Goodwill Hunting um, by the time I got Courage Under Fire. Wow. So, um, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, November of '94, uh, we sold Goodwill Hunting, and, and uh, Courage Under Fire. Gosh, I want to say it was 95. Mm -hmm. It was 95 and then came out in 96. That's yeah. amazing. How were you handling it during that time, knowing you were about to have this big year? Or did you know? Did you think it might be another Geronimo? No, I mean, Courage Under Fire, I had no, you know, uh, Ed Zwick was the director, and I remember when he saw the cut footage from the scenes with Denzel, and he, because we were in El Paso, and he came running up to me on the set, and that's when I went, okay, okay, that, it worked, you know, it's, it, it worked. And Roger Deakins was the cinematographer, oh, wow. and, he, and he had seen it, and he had seen how much weight I'd put on and, you know, to get to do the, the flashback stuff. And so he was really excited. So those things, so I felt like, okay, well, this movie, you know, I, I'll be good in this movie. But I didn't know, you know, again, if the movie was going to do. Mm -hmm. And the movie, I, I don't remember how, I mean, it did okay. I don't think it was like, it wasn't a runaway success. Um, it was just that... I had things going on a lot of different fronts because of the screenplay and, you know, but we were in development. We were sitting there in development and uh, at Castle Rock at the time, um, kind of languishing a little bit, so. How did you get it out of development and get Gus Van Sant involved? Uh, we, we came to an agreement with them whereby they agreed to give it to us in turnaround if we could sell it to somebody else for a million dollars. Um, and uh, and that and that someone else would agree to keep us in the in the roles, um, and if we couldn't, then we had to give it to them, and then we were out as actors. Um, and that was a really tough decision. And uh, but we did it, thinking that there were plenty of places that would take it because it had been a bidding war the year before when we'd mm -hmm. sold it. And uh, all the people who had bid on it called us back to meet with them, basically to tell us to our face, you know, you should have come with us. <laughs> We're not interested anymore. And, uh, and it was Kevin Smith uh, who Ben gave the script to because they'd worked together a bunch. And Ben said, will you please direct this movie? Like, we're going to lose it. And Kevin read it and said, I, I, I don't deserve to direct this movie. Uh, and he walked into Harvey's office and gave it to Harvey. Harvey hadn't read it. And Harvey read it and the next day called us. And, and we were literally on the brink of losing yeah. our script and, uh, and Harvey rode in on the white horse and saved the day. As he does. As he does, yeah. <laughs> That's Harvey Weinstein, by the way, in case you don't know. Um, he, he, he gets to go by one name, like Madonna. He does, he does. 
<laughs> he does. He does in my book, yeah, certainly. Um, and I know a lot has been said and written about the experience of Goodwill Hunting, but could you ever have imagined that it would have such an effect on people? You touched so many lives with that movie. It was amazing. No, you know, it's, it's really great looking back. I mean, it, it, uh, ben, and, ben and I made this, had this pact that, that we just wanted the movie, that no matter what, we wanted to love it. And even if nobody saw it, um, and it was a great early lesson that, you know, because even if the movie hadn't been successful, we still would have loved it, and um, and it would have meant as much as much to us. So I, I've, you know, and, you know, not to be a horrible name dropper, but but Clint Eastwood uh, said to me a couple of years ago, I was asking him about just stuff. We were sitting on the set while they were setting up a shot, and and uh, he said, you know, people have people talk about my movies. You know, they say, well, this one's a masterpiece, or that one's no good. And he goes, I love all of them. He goes, and I know exactly why I made each one of them. And I, and I wouldn't do anything differently if I had to do it again. Are there certain movies you feel that way about? I mean, one that springs to mind that, that really affected me personally was Hereafter. And I know it didn't find the biggest audience, but then I talked to people who passionately love that movie. What's interesting about that movie is um, I think it had exactly a 50% on Rotten Tomatoes. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't a normal 50%, because I looked at the reviews, and the people who liked it really, really liked it, and the people who didn't really, really didn't. It wasn't mediocre. Mm -hmm. You know, there was nothing, people were like, ah, it's fine. It was, people were angry, you know, really, like, they didn't want to talk about death, they didn't want to, yeah. they didn't want to know about any of it, and they just were angry that the movie got made, at least that's what it felt like looking at what they wrote. Whereas people who were open to that really, really dug it, you know, and, uh, and which is great. Mm -hmm. That's a great, I will take that every time, you yeah. know, over, you know, hey, you know, two stars, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> no, really, I'd, we did a movie, Gus, we, we improvised this movie uh, 12 years ago that got called Jerry, and Gus had taken out a, a mortgage on his house to pay for it, and we, it was like 15 minute stretches where nobody talked, mm -hmm. you know, it was literally like that movie. And we went to Sundance to sell it, really so Gus could have his house back. <laughs> and the reviews of that movie were, one review said, this is the most important American film of the last 20 years. But most of them said things like, and this is a quote, you will only ever see this movie if you are being tortured. <laughs> And I was like, wow, now that is a review. Wow. Um, but it really said that, you know? And, uh, and, but that's a good, I think that's a good place to be, you know? I mean, that's, that's much better than like, yeah, it's fine. You know, I mean, I, I'd really much rather have it be striking in some way than just kind of be like, eh, that's whatever. Almost, that's almost like a Spinal Tap review. I find that really hard to believe. <laughs> It was. It was probably, it was so, I think the thing, it was so brutal that it kind of felt like Spinal Tap, because it was kind of like, well, this doesn't really happen to real people, you know. <laughs> Nobody would ever really say that in a review. <laughs> um, are you good about, I mean, do you like to read your own reviews? Do you need to give it time? It's weird. Now, is, is uh, everybody's so much more aware of all aspects of the film business, you know, they, the, you know, they, they do the box office uh, reports in every newspaper. They have websites devoted to it. Um, they really get granular with it in, in, on some of these websites. And, and then Rotten Tomatoes, where everyone goes, it's kind of the default place where people go to, you know, just kind of get a sense. Like, you know, it's like, <laughs> you know, all right, 77%. Yeah, all right, I'll go see it, you know. And, and uh, um, so that. So I think you have to kind of be aware of what's being said. Mm -hmm. um, and they're hard, you know, they're hard, it's hard to not read reviews. I mean, it is for me. Um, I'm very capable of reading them and forgetting them. You know, I, I will say that. Um, and I'll skim them, you know, because they all, they come out in this giant batch, like when the movie opens and suddenly it's overnight, you know, if you're a 25% or a 95% and, and, and you really, it's just an overnight thing and it happens that fast. Um, but, you know, I, I remember when Ben did The Sum of All Fears with Morgan Freeman, he, um, his name dropping is horrible, I'm sorry. <laughs> but all my stories are anecdotal, so I mean, all my, all my uh, knowledge is anecdotal, so, uh, but 
Ben asked Morgan that question. Yeah. And, uh, and Morgan said, he said he, doesn't, he didn't read them. And, and Ben said, really? And Morgan said, here's why. And he quoted a review from the New York Times about his performance in Shakespeare in the Park and Taming of the Shrew in like the 1980s. And it was, a, it was mean, right? And then he launched into another verbatim uh, critique of Driving Miss Daisy, which was absolutely glowing and wonderful. And, and you know, you would think he was the second coming. And he said, that's the same reviewer said those two things about me. <laughs> <laughs> so at that point, I just decided not to read them anymore. <laughs> <You know? laughs> ben was so excited, he called me, he was like, we have permission to never read reviews again from Morgan Freeman. <laughs> you know? uh, but it's still hard. I mean, and it's, things have changed even since then. That was in the, you know, 2000 or yeah. 2001. And I mean, it's just, you, you know, the internet, it's just very hard to, you know, I won't read comments that people post because sure. those are awful. Yeah. Yeah. No, um, they're and just anonymous. awful and, and they're anonymous yes. and that's really chicken shit. Like, mm -hmm. I, you know what I mean? I really don't believe in that. I mean, if you have something to say, you should say it. Um, but, but, that, but they're just, I don't understand how somebody could be that angry about total strangers, yeah. that they would actually take the time out of life, their own life, their one life. <laughs> they're gonna, they're gonna, this is what, no, this is what I'm gonna do. I hate your movie, <laughs> you know, and I hate you. Um, so, so no, I learned like, I think I did. I, I probably read comments once and then just went, just no, I'm, I'm not doing that again. What's the strangest or funniest thing you've read about yourself, either in comments or something from the tabloids that just made you laugh? Uh, I actually that you've stumped me. I actually don't. Uh, <laughs> Or maybe it doesn't make you laugh. I mean, maybe it's well, really horrible. No, I rem actually, I remember something. Just to bring this back around to the Yankees for a second. <laughs> In 2004, when the Red Sox won the World Series, yeah. uh, just, before that happened, there was a game in Yankee Stadium, the second game of the that, of that playoff series. And I uh, got invited. Somebody had a ticket. And, um, and I went with Casey Affleck. Um, and uh, we were invited. And I wore a, uh, you know, they do these specialty hats. Like, so this was like a St. Patrick's Day Red Sox hat. So it was a green hat with the Boston symbol on it. It got printed in the newspaper up in Boston the next day that I'd gone into Yankee Stadium and didn't wear my Red Sox hat, right? I never, in, in, my publicist, Jennifer Allen, who's been my publicist since 1996, um, you know, I never, I get sent these things and I never respond to any of them, um, you know, because, and she, I, we just never have a comment. I mean, no comment. I called her up and was like, this is an outrage. <laughs> I was like, like George Bush the first, you know, in the yeah. Kuwait thing, this will not stand, you know what I mean? Like, and uh, she was like, Jesus, okay, well. You want to make a statement? I was like, I absolutely want to make a statement. <laughs> so we wrote out a statement and oh sent it to the God. Boston Herald who'd said, who'd said this, and, and, uh, and they retracted it. <laughs> you felt justified. I did, I did. But the other stuff, I really do forget. I really, I'm sure there's, so, there's, a, there's something weird or stupid, that I mean, a lot of stuff that's been written, but I, I, I either don't read it or I read it and forget about it. Um, just to sort of wrap up uh, the Goodwill hunting years, um, I talked to Ben recently, and he said you guys were so young, and the whole experience with the Oscars, with with all the acclaim, really to him has been a blur. Yeah. Um, w was it the same for you? Yeah. Or do you remember much about that period of time? It's really a blur. It's really a blur, and, and uh, it was too. It was just too much. Yeah. It really was too much to to process for you know, um, because the thing about uh, fame is that. You, you know, people say you change, but it's not that. It's what happens is the world is exactly the same. It's exactly the same as it was yesterday. But it does change in relation to you and only you, right? So suddenly you walk into a room and everybody looks at you. And suddenly you, it, it's, it's weird. It's really weird. But you know intellectually that the, the same things still matter, you know? It's not that important that the world has changed in relationship to you. It's only important to you. 
because these are the eyes you look out of, and they're the only eyes you look out of, right? But, but nothing else, it's not really that important. So you hear people bitching about it, and everybody's reaction was just like mine always was, like, oh, shut up, you know? <laughs> but what they're saying is basically that something strange is happening to me. I'm living in the same world, but, but everything, nobody treats me the same as they did before. And even if that's good treatment or friendly treatment, it's still very, very hard to come to terms with because your life is completely different. Uh, your, your primary relationships are always the same, you know, and they're based on the same things. But, but the new ones are, are you know, you have, that, you're, you have that that you're bringing into the relationship. Looking back, I mean, at your filmography around the time, you made a lot of really smart choices in your career. Um, when it could have gone in a different direction, you could have fallen down that rabbit hole. What do you sort of credit with um, helping you keep a clear head? Uh, well, there was a lot of luck. Um, you know, Ben got branded as the guy who wanted to be the, the big action star. The reason that happened was because Goodwill Hunting came out, and the next summer, Armageddon and Saving Private Ryan came out. Mm. And so I literally had this patina of seriousness. And Ben had this kind of, hey, he's the popcorn, he's the movie star guy. Yeah. Um, the reality was, when we'd done those, taken those jobs, you know, Goodwill Hunting hadn't come out, nobody knew who we were, and, and either of us would have taken the other job in a second. You know, I remember being in Harvey Weinstein's office when Ben asked him if he could call this director Michael Bay and please put in a good word and say that, that I'm good in Goodwill Hunting. Can you just tell him? <laughs> you know, because he doesn't, you know, he's only seen, Ben had been in Dazed and Confused, he'd been in some of Kevin's movies, but Michael Bay, I guess, was going like, well, who is this guy? You know, and so, and Harvey said, I absolutely will. Harvey instantly recognized what that would do for Ben's career if he could get in that movie, and he went, yeah, I'm happy to make the call for you. Um, but that's where we were, you know, and then suddenly we literally became famous and then these movies came out and so that kind of, you know, that's, that, that those became our identities for a little while, but none of it was true, mm -hmm. you know, it was just how it happened. Um, you were really good too at combining comedy and drama, I mean obviously you did serious films like uh, Departed and Invictus, but then you would shake it up with things like Stuck on You and Dogma. Some people don't know that's a comedy. <laughs> <laughs> I love that movie, personally. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. If you want to talk about reviews. <laughs> For Stuck on yeah. You? Yeah, yeah, How you hate Stuck on You? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, that's why I feel like yeah. if people have no heart. I yeah. that. I love, I, I love the experience of making it, and I love those guys, and, uh, and I met my wife making that movie, oh, really? so yeah, yeah, so it was a, it was a big win for me. Uh, which is harder for you, comedy or drama, or they each have their challenges? It really uh, is about the director for me. If the director, you know, knows, really understands the tone of the movie, then it's all, you know, they're just like the greatest safety net. I remember doing uh, The Informant, and Steven Soderbergh, <clears throat> there was this scene in The Informant where I had to uh, apologize to the entire town, um, you know, about what, you know, for what I'd done. And, and we had the transcript of what the guy said. And so it's like 8 o'clock, and we're somewhere in, in, uh, in uh, Illinois, Springfield, I think we were in. I think it was the actual courtroom, and I was in his actual chair, and I stood up and I, and I said to the town exactly what the, the, the man, Mark Whitaker, had said. And, um, and I got choked up, and as I imagined he had, and, um, and uh, it was the first take, and I thought it was really great. And Stephen said, cut, and he walked over. He was about as far away as these cameras are, because we were starting with uh, like a master. And he came, he walked over, and uh, people kind of cleared out, and he just comes and he, he sits on the desk. I'm in the chair, in the defendant's chair, and he kind of leans up on the, on the table, and he's like, uh, <clears throat> no. <laughs> he's like, wait a minute, what do you mean, no? What do you mean, no? And he goes, no. And I go, no, wait, hold on, hang on, hang on, Stephen, wait. I, I think that's how this happened. I said, I think, and, and I said, and I really felt something. Like, you can say no all you want, but I felt, I know what's real, I and I know what I felt. <laughs> and he goes, no, 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 you're missing the point. It's just that you're in the wrong movie. Mm. Wow. And I went, okay, uh, 
get me in the right movie. And he thought about it for a second. And then he goes, do it like an awards acceptance speech. And he got up and he walked back to the camera. And I was like, of course, like this is the guy's moment. Yeah. You know, this is it. The whole town is there. He has an audience. Like, this is the greatest thing that's ever happened to him, you know? <laughs> And so we did, we did the scene again, and it's a, but, but that is literally a director saving my bacon, you know, because the scene would have, wouldn't have fit, mm -hmm. you know? And, and in, the, in that vein, there's a great story which I got from, from Robert Redford um, uh, when I worked with him, uh, because I'd always heard it and I wanted to know if it was true. And the story was that the great scene with Donald Sutherland when, she, when Mary Tyler Moore comes down the stairs yeah. and he's sitting at the table and it's so simple and it's just this shot of him and he basically says that he thinks he, he doesn't love her anymore, like their, their marriage is over. And, uh, and he's so the choice, he's brilliant in that scene and it's so beautiful and simple. And, and I had heard that it was a reshoot, you know? And, and so I, I asked Redford, is that true? And he said, yeah. Oh. And I said, well, what's the deal? What happened? And he goes, we shot that scene, and Donald did, in a vacuum, he goes, one of the most, it was one of the most virtuosic pieces of acting I've ever seen in my life. Snot was flying in tears, he said, rage, he said it was just amazing. It like shell-shocked people on the crew, they were applauding afterwards, and Donald came up to Redford and said, well, you know, what'd you think? And Redford said, we don't have it. And, and Sutherland evidently said, no, he said, that, what just happened, happened. He said, and that was one of the most significant th moments of my life, what, what I just did. You know, that is the culmination of all of these years of doing this. Like, <laughs> that's the best thing I've ever done. What are you talking about? And, and Redford said, okay, I'll make a deal with you. I'll, we'll, we'll wrap this scene. We'll, we'll move on. Um, I will cut this into the movie. And if you want to reshoot it, we'll reshoot it. Wow. And Sutherland said, great. And a few months later, he cut the picture together, and he was showing it to him. And, so, and they got to that scene. And, and as Redford said to me, Sutherland leapt out of his chair and said, I got it, I got it, I got it, I know. <laughs> and he didn't even have to see the rest of the movie. Yeah. And, and what it was was that when they came back with a skeleton crew, I don't even think Mary Tyler Moore was there. Wow. He, he went through that same thing that he'd done publicly or for the crew. He did it in his trailer, right? And he went through all of that. And then he came out and he sat at the table. Because the scene's about the, uh, the realization, the understanding it's, it, that, that it's over. Mm -hmm. So you've gone through the horrific, you know, the, um, the, the emotional part and you're just tired and you're just, and you're just honest. And he just did like two or three takes, you know, simply just... And, and that was it. And it's beautiful in the movie. And it's so simple. Um, but, uh, but again, it was that, it's that, it's that thing. Because we, actors go by, by moments, you know. And we know when we're in the moment and when it's real. Um, but, but you need somebody who can keep everything in this larger context. Because at the end of the day, you're part of the story. You know, you're not the story. Um, and you have, a, you have to serve the story. Uh, but it's the director's job to make sure you're in the story, you know. Speaking of simple little things, one of my favorite parts in the informant is when Mark's just been given like some horrible news and you just move your wig ever so slightly. Yeah. And I have to admit, embarrassingly enough, I didn't realize it was a wig until that point. Well, that's a good story behind that uh, because uh, Whitaker had a hair piece and there was, in Kurt Eichenwald's book, they talk about it a lot and apparently the FBI guys, they were 50-50 split on whether it was a piece or not. Right? <laughs> so we may have experimented with all these different ones to make, you know, because we needed it to look like, we wanted that exact thing for people to go like, is that a, is that a, and so one day on the set, I was sitting there talking to Steven and I had an itch, you know, and so as I'm talking to him, so imagine the hat's the wig, I just went, yeah, and so anyway, you know, and, I, and, and the thing moved like that. And he goes, what just happened? <laughs> And I go, what are you talking about? He goes, do that again. And I went like this. And he goes, I got to find a place to put that in the movie. 
And so the reveal of the piece was, was at, at that really low moment, he just kind of sits there and he kind of adjusts his, his, his thing. But it came, it's one of those things that, one of those accidents that, that happen all the time that are really fun. It's, everyone else was like, how could you not know that was a wig? Which is what they all said. At the end, all the guys, you know, who, who from the FBI who had thought, it, no, that's his hair, you know. That's what the other guys said to them. Um, in addition to having a sense of humor on screen, you also appear to have a very good sense of humor about yourself off screen. Um, I'm spe thinking um, mostly of Sarah Silverman's right. video. Right. <laughs> I don't know if I'm allowed to say it. I'm fucking Matt Damon, I can say it? Okay. Um, well, I mean. Yeah, well, I, I, <laughs> um, how did that come about and how did you know it would work? I mean, when you went into that. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, I, I didn't, I just thought it was funny, like we, you know, uh, I was try we were trying to figure out, um, the last piece that we'd done was, um, for the Kimmel Show, was, was a, a recreation of the Bourne Ultimatum trailer, and I really love this piece, it's up on the internet, but we, it's, we, it's we, the idea is that Jimmy keeps bumping me from his show, now, I'm getting bumped from my own movies mm -hmm. because in this trailer, Guillermo shows up dressed like Jason Bourne <laughs> doing the dialogue, and we literally bump into each other in the middle of the trailer. And I'm like, wait a minute, are you from Kimmel? You know, <laughs> now I'm getting bumped from my own movies? And, uh, and it was really fun and, and, uh, and really funny, and, and, and we were trying to figure out what to, where to go from there and uh, what could kind of top that. And Wayne McClamey, who directed that spot, called with the idea, and I guess that Sarah had had, um, and, uh, and the original idea was, was, it was supposed to be, it was Jimmy's 40th birthday, and they were going to have a surprise show for him. So he had agreed to come out and not know who any of the guests were, and not know, he, you know, literally not know what the show was. The entire thing was a surprise. And the first guest was going to be Sarah Silverman, and she was going to come out and say, you know, I'm really, I love you, and it's been great, you know, because they, they used to be in a relationship together. You know, and it's really, and, and I just, you know, I just, there's just one little thing I think I should, I, I, I just want to tell you, but I put it into a video, and, and so, yeah, great, and they were going to play, I'm fucking Matt Damon. <laughs> uh, and then the writer's strike happened, and so, so, uh, his birthday came during the strike, so obviously the show was dark, nobody could write for it, and, and, uh, and so they just did it, um, you know, they just put it on his show, I said, kind of some other moments, Sarah just came out, and and did it. But it was like, I got a call from those guys, they pitched me the idea, and I went, that's really funny. Um, you know, I think it's funny. Um, maybe, you know, but the, if, look, if it's not funny, nobody's going to, you know, it's not going to get, people aren't going to keep watching it, so it'll just die on the vine. So there's not really anything you're risking. I mean, the only thing you're risking is, and I realized at the time, I mean, my oldest would have been seven, and I literally got up to shoot the video uh, shooting call was 7 o'clock because I had to leave it at 9.45 uh, because I had a parent-teacher conference. <laughs> and I remember that, like, so we had to work really fast. I mean, there were a lot of shots in that video, yeah. so we were hustling to get them all and dance numbers and all this stuff. Uh, I had to record the song that morning because um, I had a couple lines in the song, you know. Um, and so we did it, and it was like a fever dream. It went really fast. And then I got in my car to go to uh, the parent-teacher conference. And I'm like driving along, hey, parent-teacher conference, I think I'm going to make it. And then I thought, oh my god, I just did, I'm fucking Matt Damon. <laughs> like, I can't do this shit anymore. I got, you know, what am I, I mean, these people are going to see this. Like, I have a kid, I got a kid in school. I got to go face the teachers. And, and luckily, luckily, the teachers really liked it. <laughs> Well, it turns out it. teachers have a sense of humor, so I wasn't ostracized from my community. Yeah. Uh, did Jimmy really not know it was going to air? Was it? No, he had no idea. <laughs> he had no. The, the original idea was great, and I wish it could have. We could have done it, you know, because um, uh, that would have been a total surprise yeah. among, you know, in, in the middle of a show full of surprises. Uh, and then, did you know that they were working on a response video, or did that come as a surprise to you? I was in Morocco. I was shooting. Uh, I was shooting uh, the Green Zone. And I called Ben for some other reason. And he's like, dude. <laughs> he's like, I'm in a recording studio, dude. And I was like, what, the, what are you doing in a recording studio? And he's like, I'm doing a response to your video. <laughs> and I'm like, really? And he goes, Harrison Ford just walked in. <laughs> he was like, this thing is huge. <laughs> 
And I was like, well, why the fuck do you get a budget? And I don't. What the hell? You know? There's like six of us in the Delano Hotel in Miami with like two hours to shoot our thing. Like, you got Harrison Ford in yours? What the hell? So, and that was like, if you've ever seen it, that's a bit, the production yeah, value huge. is insane on that thing. They yeah. had, you know, and, and it, they had the whole We Are the World ending with like, I mean, it was really good. Um, another meme that you're associated with a lot is the uh, 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 Team America. Yes. yes. Now, did you have any kind of warning that you were going to be in that? No. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I did. I mean, I, I love those guys. I think they're really, really funny. And I know people, they offend some people. I think they're amazing. And, uh, and I love Team America. I yeah. think it's hysterically funny. I sign that picture of the puppet, I sign more than any other picture. Like, you know, really? when you see the autograph people that, that yeah. come and they have a stack of pictures. There's like half of them will be the puppet. <laughs> and they always ask, can you please write Matt Damon? <laughs> yeah, I know. All right, M. A, 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 A. You know. So, <clears throat> but I never, I never talked to Trey and Matt about it. And, uh, you know, but, but I did. I'm a big fan of theirs. It is very hard not to introduce you as Matt Damon. I know, I know. <laughs> Thank you for resisting me. Yeah, well, until now. Um, uh, so I should get to your current project, Promised Land, which is uh, reteams you with Gus Van Sant. You co-wrote with John Krasinski. How did this collaboration come about? Well, John came to me with the idea. I met John through Emily Blunt, his wife, and, uh, and uh, yeah, the Adjustment Bureau. Um, and, uh, and, and, my wife and I just became really close with them, and we would, we would hang out with them a lot. And, and John is one of those guys, he really reminds me of when I first met George Clooney. George was, he was really known, for, he was the guy from ER. Like, everyone's like, hey, that guy, oh yeah, George, yeah, he's the guy from ER. And, uh, but if you hung around him and talked about movies, you realize, like, this is not the guy from ER. This guy is going places and uh, he's really really smart and good um, and like Steven Soderbergh had done out of sight with him and instantly formed a, co a company with him and everybody at the time was saying well why would Steven Soderbergh form a company with the guy from ER you know <laughs> but it was because he'd, he'd, he'd gone through a script with him and taken his notes and you know and and uh, and, and realized where George was headed and um, and that's how I feel about John I mean John's brilliant on his show but you know, that character that he plays and that, you know, and he's a brilliant comic actor, but he can, he, the breadth and scope of his talent is, is, is huge. And, and in 12 years, I think we'll be looking at him, the, you know, because he can, he, can, he can write, he can direct, he can produce, he can act, he can really do anything. And, and so I instantly started looking for stuff to do with him, and, and he had this idea. Uh, and so we sat down, and he was doing the show, and I was doing Cameron Crowe's movie, uh, We Bought a Zoo. And we, so we would work on our day jobs during the week. And then Saturday mornings, he would show up for breakfast at the place that I had rented, because I had my four kids. So um, the default kind of writing place was my house uh, on, on the weekends. And he would just kind of suck it up with the kids climbing all over us. <laughs> and, like, and, we, and we would write all day Saturday and Sunday. And, and then we'd revise during the week um, and take notes and then come back with everything and start fresh the next Saturday morning. And, Things just, it just happened really fast. It, we, you know, it became clear that, that we were going to make this movie. That, that um, There's a weird thing that happens when you write, particularly the way we write, you know, and the, the only times I've written, I've written with actors. And, um, you know, in that process of improvising, the characters really do start to talk back. And, and, and that's when it gets really exhilarating because you're both playing all the characters, but you start to feel how they would all respond in these situations, and, and, you, and it's fun, and it's, and it's funny. Um, and so you laugh a lot, and you get, and, and it just, uh, you know, and then you, you blurt it all out onto a page, and, and, and then, you know, revise and revise and revise, and, 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 and that's it. And, and, but, but it. But we hit that point where the characters were really coming alive um, pretty, pretty quickly. Did he come to you and say, I have an idea about fracking, or...? No, no, he came and see, we, we had been talking about, when we weren't talking about movies, this idea about uh, American identity, and like, what, what is going on in the country right now? And, uh, where, and, and John had been ruminating on it, and, and, 
he had this idea, and he went to Dave Eggers, the great writer Dave Eggers, who he knew from Away We Go, uh, the film that John did, the Sam Mendes film that Dave wrote. And, uh, and so the two of them started hashing stuff out, um, but Dave eventually had to leave because he was going to go write his book. I mean, he's an incredibly prolific writer. He's got, he, he, he's got a lot of uh, things going on at once, and he, he just, so he couldn't write the movie. So John had this thing, and he comes to me, he's like, well, what do you think? Do you, do you want to do this? And I was like, well, let's sit down and talk about it. And in the course of like those first couple sessions, it was like, wow, this, is, this, is gonna, this, could, really, this could really happen. And, then, and so we wrote the script you know, in a few months. We, we, we had, a, we had a, a draft, a draft that was, that was good enough to send to Frances McDormand, because that was who we were writing for, oh, really? uh, for, the, for the lead woman, yeah. And, uh, and then she said yes. She read it and she said yes. So that was a huge validation for us. And so then we had the three main characters and we knew the actors who were playing them. So we just, we just went and did it. One of the things I love about this movie is it is, you know, it's a, it's a current topic like the energy crisis, but it really is a character drama. Right. Um, was it a hard sell after you had all these elements in place? Or once you got Gus on board, did that make things easier? No, I mean, we, once we had Gus, because um, I was originally going to direct it, and then, um, and then I couldn't because of my schedule, and then we got Gus, which was great, and we like to joke that my biggest contribution as a producer was firing myself as the director, <laughs> because we got Gus Van Sant. Um, but, but then the three of us, plus Chris Moore, who also produced Good Will Hunting, um, and, uh, and produced this with us, uh, we went and did this, you know, the financing meetings here in, in town, and sat with, like, you know, the big, you know, Focus, who eventually bought it, and, and uh, Fox Searchlight, and you know a, there are a whole, you know, there were probably five, five or six meetings we had, um, and it was just about, you know, trying to trying to figure out who we could get, who we really felt would be great creative partners, and uh, you know, we needed, we, we we thought we needed about 18 million bucks to make the movie. And it turned out we came in under budget a little bit. Uh, and a lot of that's because Gus is so efficient, because he's so experienced, but um, I would have been way over budget. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, we, but we really, we settled on Focus because they, you know, for one thing, the person who runs Focus is James Seamus, who's a producer and a writer, and, and, uh, and, and it really helped. We, we had a real shorthand with him, because he's, you know, he's been under the hood of the car before. Um, so, uh, so we had a really, the script, Got better when they got involved. You know, they they really uh, uh, were helpful, and they were they were just great partners for us. And 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 because we wanted to go fast, we were we sold it in January, and we were shooting in April. Wow. And uh, and there was I mean there were grammar mistakes all over the screen, but really there were. And uh, you know, but Seamus is, is you know he gets it. He's been there, and so he just so he he could see where we were going. You know. This has such an amazing cast. I mean, Hal Holbrook, yeah. uh, Scoot McNary yeah. shows up, Titus Welliver, you mentioned Francis. How involved were you in the casting? And was it just a matter of going out to people you knew about? Yeah, uh, I mean, in Scoot's case, we didn't know about Scoot. In fact, when I saw Argo uh, in March, right before we started shooting, I had to come out here and, uh, and Ben showed me Argo. Um, well, his first it was a rough cut of Argo. And Scoot was in it and he was great. And I was like, I thought we discovered Scoot. <laughs> like, what, <laughs> how do you know about Scoot? And, uh, and he said Andrew Dominic had called him when he did Killing Me Softly uh, and, you know, said, mate, there's an actor in my movie who you need to put in your movie, mate. Uh, you wouldn't believe how good he is. His name is Scoot McNary. And uh, Ben was like, what is a Scoot McNary? And he's like, trust me. So, uh, so Ben read Scoot and, you know, cast him immediately. Uh, Scoot came about because Gus uh, was auditioning people and uh, if we couldn't be in the room for the audition they were taped and uh, we got we would get a, a batch of uh, tapes at the end of the day uh, uh, on, on, on the computer not not by snail mail so <laughs> so they get emailed to us and so you know we'd sit there and, and watch all the actors and and Gus would, would have highlighted the ones that he really had an eye on. And the day Scoots came in, it was like, you, you stop everything you're doing and watch this guy. And, uh, and we, in, 
he was reading a different part. The part that he ended up getting was written for a 60-year-old guy. Wow. Um, and we just rewrote it immediately. We just said, well, there's no reason he can't be 30. Um, you know, the idea was the guy had lost his son in, in, in Iraq and was there on this farm raising the grandson. And we said, all right, it's the nephew, and he lost his brother, and we're done. Like, wow. Yeah. Um, and, and Hal, we wrote Hal's part for somebody needed to be from, you know, the previous generation, the, you know, the former America, to kind of speak to where, we, where we've come from and where we are, but in an exceedingly simple and honest and genuine way. And Hal is 88 years old now. He's, uh, he's just the consummate actor. I mean, he's had this Mark Twain show that you, some of you may have seen. He's been doing the Mark Twain show. He hasn't missed a year. He's been doing it for 58 years. And, and we had to book his dates around his show. Really? Because he'd have to go to Phoenix, or he'd have to go to, you know, and he, would, he, he just goes to these places and does his one-man show. He's been doing it for 58 years. And, uh, and so he's just one of those guys. Um, very, you know, one of those few people who get to that point of total mastery, who just can just be there and be completely convincing. And, uh, and we, were, we were very lucky to get him, yeah. Now, working with someone like Hal Holbrook, and you've worked with Robert De Niro, and I mean, just about everyone, do you ever get intimidated by anyone? Uh, no, I mean, not intimidated, really excited, like, like nervous, but not nervous, because Hal doesn't put off any, he's just such a positive person uh, and such a team player, you know, that he doesn't, he doesn't put off anything that would, that would be intimidating. He's, he's the opposite. He's incredibly welcoming. He's a, he's a gentleman. Um, but excited and nervous in the sense that, like, what, I want to see him do this. I get to be here this close when he does it, and what a privilege, privilege that is. A, a real, that's a moment in my life that, that it's, it's why I'm, I'm lucky to do this, you know. Um, you know, John was there and Gus was there right behind the camera, and you know, he'd do a take, and we'd just turn around and look at each other like, oh my God, that just happened. Um, and, uh, you know, it was just a really, it was a really, you know, very, very positive experience. But no, intimidating, I mean, I'm trying to think, I mean, it is intimidating. I was intimidated uh, working with De Niro, um, and I think he deals with that a lot. Yeah. Uh, and does everything he can to disarm it. But there's still just a hump, you, you got a hurdle you have to clear you know, where you just have to get over that, that, and it doesn't happen right away. Well, you had De Niro as a director, too, which has to be doubly intimidating. Yeah, I mean, he gives you a note, and it's just like, you really have to go to that place where you go, like, am I, you know, because it's easy to doubt yourself. Um, and, uh, and when somebody you really admire gives you a note, you know, you're, you can go to that place where you're like, oh my god, he thinks I'm terrible. He thinks I'm terrible. <laughs> Robert De Niro thinks I stink. Oh my God, uh, I can't feel my feet, you know. Um, but uh, or you can go look. This is how we make movies, you know, and this is how we make theater. This is what we do. We we, you know, this is he's doing his job, you know. He's helping me do my job, and uh, just come on, keep going, you know. Um, but it is, you know, sometimes that's a problem. Yeah. Uh, I remember when he did The Good Shepherd, um, Angelina Jolie told me that he, she actually auditioned for that role, which oh. kind of shocked me. Um, I imagine, when was the last time you had to audition? Um, it's been a while. Yeah, it's been a while. Good. <laughs> um, though, uh, though Coppola always said, if he, he always said, I don't understand when actors, you know, your people who have an audition while don't audition. He said, I, I always figure you need to audition the director. If they're giving you the chance to audition, you should do it for the same reason the director's doing. Go into it going, I, I want to see what you got, you know, and, and can I work with you? Um, you know, which I, which I, and I'd never heard anybody say it that way, because, uh, though I will say about auditions, like I, I always had a chip on my shoulder. I mean, you get rejected so much that I always kind of went in kind of ready to pick a fight. Um, and it wasn't until Good Will Hunting that I realized that the people who were doing the auditioning desperately want you to be great. 
because it solves so many of their problems if you just come in and grab the role. Like Scoot came in and it was just like, okay, rewrite the role for him and it's just his. And wow, he, we're going to get to watch him do that. And, um, uh, and so if, if I went back to audition, I'd be thinking about it in a different way. Do you remember, did you have any bad auditions? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, hundreds. Do you remember your worst one? Or have you blocked well, it out? <laughs> no, I mean, the, you know, the, the, bad, the really bad ones, oftentimes, it's just like you don't, even, you, know, you don't even get a call back from the casting director. You know, and those are ones that are just, but that's okay, because they're so bad, or you're so wrong for the part, that it's just you get snuffed out. Like, the more painful ones are the ones where you get close. That, that is much, much, much more painful because, because then you have hope. Then you know, they think I might be right for this, you know, and, and, and all that work you put in, and you never know. I mean, it's just, I have, I have a lot of those. I mean, I had a lot. That's, that kept me going for years was actually getting callbacks because you, know, you go, okay, well, the business is telling me, or the people who do this, these casting directors or this director or, you know, is speaking back to me and saying, you know, you, you should keep doing this, you know. Um, those ones where you get rejected out of hand, like you walk in, you walk out, and Ben and I used to call it getting okay thanks. <laughs> you know, how'd it go to that? Fuck, I got okay thanks. Because that's what they do, they go, okay, thanks. And, and, and turn around and like walk out. So we just call it, you know, and, and, yeah. and if you're going through it with other people, then it's cool because we all get okay thanks, then you're never going to be right for every role and, and, and you know, you take the, the experience and, 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 you know, try to, try to build off it or get something out of it. But, uh, but the more painful ones were definitely, you know, primal fear or things like that, where you go, that is, whoever plays this role is going to be launched, mm -hmm. you know. And Edward, Ed, and you talk about, you know, I think the right person gets the part, too, you know? The right per guy always gets the part. I was supposed to be in Milk. I was going to be uh, Josh Brolin's character. Really? Yeah, Gus called me up and sent me the script, of bawling, bawling my eyes out reading that script. It was so beautiful. I, I said, I'm in, you know, I, I got all the research materials. He sent me all this footage of Dan White and, uh, you know, and then uh, the, uh, the movie pushed because of Sean Penn's schedule for a couple months. It was, it was a very minor push, you know, it was like, we're not going to start in November, we're going to start in January. But in January, I had to go do the green zone, and the writer's strike was looming, and so I, I literally couldn't, you know, it, it was a complete conflict. So, uh, and then I saw what Josh Brolin did, yeah. you know, and I went, the right guy got the part, you know, what can I say? I, I would have loved to have been in that movie, but um, the, mo the movie's not... The movie didn't suffer because I was, wasn't in it, you know. Same thing with the fighter in Christian Bale's part. Yeah, now that's the right guy got the part. <laughs> yeah, definitely, uh, the right guy got the part. I just want to take a couple quick questions from the audience. Um, again, apologies if I butcher your name. I've been there. A uh, question from Perry wants to know, to date, what's the most emotionally taxing role you've had to play? Uh... I mean, Courage Under Fire probably took the most out of me, just in terms of the, it was really hard. <clears throat> it was a really good lesson in uh, that, that most of the work you do when you're preparing, um, nobody ever knows about. And it's literally between you and yourself. And nobody cares and nobody ever will care. But if you're vigilant in your time when nobody's looking, um, that's the that's the work in preparation that pays off the most, and um, and that was a really good lesson for me to have when I was 25, um, because that's really helped me um, to to push myself when there's no, you know, because it's like a four month thing, you know, and it, you, you want to take a night off sometimes, but um, but at that time in my career, I shouldn't have, and I didn't, and. Uh, and that, and that paid off. So, but, but it, you know, it came at a price, certainly. Uh, James wants to know, uh, when preparing for a role, do you ever get private coaching? Yeah, um, uh, certainly with, you know, things like dialect and uh, um, things like, you know, depending on the movie, um, what's great is if you have enough prep time and they're willing to give things to you, like, um, you know, for those Bourne movies, I, I'd, 
I was terrified of those because I, you know, I, I was the guy from Goodwill Hunting and the talented Mr. Ripley, you know, that was not an action guy. And, uh, and so I really trained as hard as I could doing everything from firearms training um, for hours and hours and hours at a time. Um, and the great thing about it is they give you access to these experts. Um, and these people are ready. They're, you know, if you can get them on the payroll, they'll, they'll just do it as much as you want. And so all of that stuff, to try to make all of that stuff second nature, are just believable. I mean, it's really, it's a magic trick. Like, the, you know, I remember there was a line in the Bourne script that Tony Gilroy had written that the first time he touches the gun, he throws it down because he, he realizes, he, he, he realizes uh, how comfortable it is in his hand, mm -hmm. you know? And he just instantly knows he's spent thousands and thousands of hours with this thing. And so, um, so, I, so I just got a replica gun, you know, and, uh, you know, besides going to the range, just would sit there, you know, just when I was watching television, just, just dropping the magazine out and loading it and dropping it and loading it and just so that, so that I didn't have to look at it and just little things, just holding it so that it got comfortable in my hand. Coppola is a big believer in that. There was a scene in The Rainmaker where I'm supposed to pick up a gun and I'm really agitated and I run and I pick up the gun and he'd put it in a freezer and he'd done it for a long time. He'd put it in a freezer and he, he would do things like that. He put rocks in my shoes in a scene where he wanted me uncomfortable and then he said, just, don't, just walk normally, you know. And that was a really good lesson. And, you know, rather than trying to, you know, like when you're drunk, you're trying to act sober, yeah. right? Or when you're, you know, when you're uncomfortable, you're trying to be comfortable. So make yourself uncomfortable and then try to be comfortable. It's a lot, you know, you don't have to think about it as, mu uh, as much. But, but so, so coaching, I, I, I don't get acting coaching, but I get coaching in all those other things um, that, that make up the performance. Uh, Victor wants to know, what would you have done if you weren't an actor? Uh, I probably would have just been a writer, um, but uh, I would have loved to have been a director, but I don't know how I would have made it there. Um, all of the knowledge I have about directing comes from watching directors, and, uh, and that's a big benefit of being an actor, is you get to go, um, go watch these, other, all the, all these people in their processes. Other directors don't get to watch each other. Yeah. So directors oftentimes ask me about other directors because they all know how to do it, but they know how to do it the way they know how to do it. Um, so there's a real uh, uh, kind of good thing you get as an actor to be able to see all that. We have a lot of questions, probably half this stack, is wanting to know if you're going to be collaborating with Ben again. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't know on what, but, but yeah. I mean, we're, we're uh, you know, the great thing is we have this little company together, and so now my partner in the company is the hottest director in Hollywood. <laughs> so that's really good for our little company because uh, people are sending us a lot of material. Um, and, uh, and so we're looking at stuff. We've got a couple things we've been developing that we've been talking about. But, uh, you know, we really want it to, whatever it is, to, it's that goodwill hunting rule. We yeah. want to make sure that we love it. Um, so, so we have our eyes open. You know, we'll see. Something that you guys could both act in, or you're open to? Either way, I mean, I would love to be directed by him. I think that would be a lot of fun. Um, and uh, he's clearly a fantastic director. Um, and I'd love to direct him, you know. He, he was in actor jail for a while. Um, you know, I mean, I remember talking to him 10 years ago when he was on the cover of, you know, those magazines every week. And, and no one knew more than him what a disaster it was. He said, I'm in the worst place you can be. He goes, I, I sell magazines and not movie tickets, you know? And, and he, it was just a big hole, and it just took him a decade, but he dug his way out. And, uh, and, and I know what he wants is to work. He, 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 he loves acting, and he's, he's at his best when he trusts the director. And so he wants, to f he wants some directors that he can trust to, to, to work with. Um, so. So I'd love to direct him in something, and uh, and now I'm sure you know his performance in the town, and then his performance in Argo are so good that yeah. now he, now now the the big directors I think are starting to call and yeah. and, and want to hire him as an, just as an actor. Uh, finally, Sherilyn wants to know um, which of your movies does your family like to watch the most? My kids, my yeah. my. Uh, well, there's only like a couple of them they can see. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> Thirty Rock, maybe. Yeah. yeah uh, let's see. Uh, I mean, they like the. I, I played one of those little krill in Happy Feet too, so they've seen they've seen that a couple of times. They like that. One. Yeah. That's right, fantastic work. That that and The Departed. <laughs>
<laughs> well, congratulations again on another great film. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for taking time. Thank you.